You're in us. And Lord, when we turn on the six o'clock news, Lost. I mean like lost. I don't mean spiritually. I mean <laughs> physically you had no clue where you were. Raise your hand if you've been lost. Come on, admit it, guys. Oh! <laughs> I've been lost on many occasions. In fact, the aircraft carrier, you, it's easy to get lost on an aircraft carrier. You know, it's 20 stories high, 20 decks, 5,000 people on this thing. You can go for six months on a deployment, and every day as you walk through the hangars or through the, the chow halls, you'll see somebody you hadn't seen in the entire deployment. 5,000. Well, as you're wandering around getting to the barber shop or going to get a haircut, or, you know, all those things involved on a ship, you get lost because it's just vast. And they have actually on the bulkheads, just like you do at the mall, you are here. They have a picture of the aircraft carry, and it says, you are here. <laughs> and you go, I thought it was over there. So, yes, sometimes we do get lost. And to help us along the way, I've got my show-and-tell bag here. So let me get this thing out. It's a little heavy. There we go. I have a maritime compass. This is off a real ship. And it's uh, the magnetic compass inside mineral oil. And this would be mounted down onto a stanchion on a ship. They would call a binnacle. A little Navy term here, right? And anybody know what these iron balls on either side of the compass are for? Anybody know? A little trivia time. No? Well, if you have a compass, what's going to affect the compass? Anything that's iron. 
right? Because it's magnetic. And so if you're on an iron ship or you have even a sailing ship that has iron fittings, everything around it, you have to try to find the true north, right? So you adjust these balls in and out to counterbalance, to counteract the magnetic effect of the ship onto the compass. Does that make sense? Cool. Great. I know you catch on. Red is port, green is starboard, just to let you know. So when you're out in the ships, you know, it's port to port, red to red. That's how ships get along out there in the ocean without streets. Well, I brought it along because sometimes when we get lost in life, we've got to find our way. Today's message is uh, when the map ends, the adventure begins. It was called the Core of Discovery. In 1804, two men, commissioned by President Thomas Jefferson, found themselves on an adventure of a lifetime. What Meriwether Lewis and William Clark did not fully understand at the time is that their search for waterway across the North America, how it would fundamentally change and expand our nation. A nation up until this point that every two of three citizens lived only 50 miles from the Atlantic seaboard in 1804. Two out of three lived within 50 miles. You think about that in 1804. So he commissioned Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to go find out what's out there. Here's a short video of the core of discovery. Editions in history, it may also have been the most dangerous. Before man journeyed to the moon, there was another expedition to a new frontier, an odyssey that took over two years, crossing more than 8,000 miles of terrain to the Pacific Ocean and back. They faced unimaginable hardships and unpredictable dangers. With incredible courage and determination, they encountered an extraordinary land and remarkable humanity. A true life adventure that defined a continent and changed the course of a nation's history forever. National Geographic presents Lewis and Clark, Great Journey West. So I'm doing a series this summer on the great adventure, and I'm using real-life stories, whether it be Shackleton or whoever it might be, to inspire us about this great adventure we're on and in the Christian walk. The United States had just completed the Louisiana Purchase. It was a pretty good deal they got in real estate. President Thomas Jefferson wanted to find out actually what he bought. And so he sent out Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to do that. The Corps consisted of 33 men. They would leave civilization in May of 1804 and not return to St. Louis until September of 1806. Now, if you remember, Shackleton and his crew were abandoned on the ice, gone for over about 202 years, right? The Corps of Discovery was the same way, almost two and a half years. St. Louis was the last known point of civilization in Missouri, on the Missouri. And it would be, they would be gone two years and some odd months. And just like Shackleton's Antarctic adventure, they would return with every single man, with the exception of one. And that one was a sergeant who had died of appendicitis right after they set sail from St. Louis. So I don't really count that one as one. To, they really hadn't gotten to the adventure yet. 
So one year after embarking on their journey from St. Louis up the Missouri River, Lewis and Clark found themselves in what we would now know as North Dakota, Fort Mandan. They were now off the map. There were no more maps. That was it. Now they had to rely on what the trappers were telling them or what the Indians were telling them, what is out there. The title of my sermon today is, When the Map Ends, the Adventure Begins. <laughs> you ever been there in life? When the map ends, the adventure begins. Rumors abounded about what was going to be out there in the West. Volcanoes, geysers, woolly mammoths, blue-eyed Indian. And there was even the idea that somehow the lost tribe of Israel was out there somewhere. I mean, there were all kinds of wild ideas. Rumors abound of what they would find. They had heard the story about a great bear that lived in the Northwest. We would know it today as the grizzly bear. They had never seen a grizzly bear. They knew what black bears and brown bears were, but the men had never seen a grizzly bear. And so some of the men had, uh, Mary Werther Lewis wrote in his journal that some of his men were curious to find this great bear. They just wanted to see it. One day, while Two canoes with two men each were paddling along on a hunting expedition to bring meat back to the, to the core. We're paddling along a, a tributary along the Missouri. And as they came into North Dakota there, they, they discovered this bear was laying down on a bank way up high on a, on a ridge. And he was sleeping along the wild berries. And his head was up and they saw him there. And so they decided they would shoot the bear. Smooth bore, black powdered rifle at about 100 yards. And so one, the marksman, took aim, fired his musket, and it hit the bear right in the rump. The bear jumped up, as they describe it, as if he was stung by a bee. <laughs> you know you're in trouble then. The bear spun around, saw the four men on the banks of the river, and came charging down at the four men at the bank. The three men, terrified now that this massive male grizzly bear was bearing down on them, fired their volley, all three muskets, and just like in the movies, the bear crumpled and slid and stopped right there in front of them. Mary Rather Lewis writes in his journal, he says this, the men's curiosity about the bear has been satisfied. <laughs> That's it, we don't need to mess with the bear anymore. They didn't know what was gonna be out there. And now at Fort Mandan, they really knew they were moving off the map. When the map ends, the adventure begins. And the Bible verse we have for our series today, or for our whole series for the summer, is Matthew 4, 18 through 20. We've read it before, I'll read it again. Matthew 4, 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. You know, Heather and I didn't talk about the, the song that you were singing, the invitation that he gives, come. Jesus always giving an invitation to come and to follow him. Wow. Whether or not the disciples understood all of that, whether or not the disciples truly comprehended all that was going to take place right from the start, to simply leave their nets and follow this man. Just like the men of the HMS Endurance, as they followed Sir Ernest Shackleton to the Antarctic, now Lewis and Clark asked their men to follow them off the map. Now, most of you who grew up in the Northwest know the story of Lewis and Clark. I didn't grow up in the Northwest. I grew up in the South. But you know what their example of the great adventure they had. But the Corps of Discovery almost lost their way in their very first year. Going straight up against the current in the Missouri, starting at St. Louis, they made their all the way up to North Dakota among the Indian tribe called the Mandan, and there they spent their first winter, and it was called Fort Mandan. The following spring, they set out 
and headed west, still on the Missouri River. The Missouri River flowing south, goes across and then down. So now they're going up the river against the current, across North Dakota, and now almost into Montana. And there on the edge of North Dakota and Montana, they encounter two large rivers that merge together into the Missouri. Which way do you go? They had no clue. No one prepared them for this. Which, which river do we decide to go up? And so they camped for two days. Lewis and Clark sent a team one way and a team the other way for two days to come back and reconnoiter and try to determine which river is it that's going to take us all the way to the Pacific. Of course, they eventually discovered there will be the Rockies. <laughs> there was no river across the North America. They came back and they decided they would take the river to the right, which was the Missouri River, and they chose correctly. <laughs> and so they continued on with their journey. But for a long time, they thought they were lost. They didn't know which direction to go. Lewis and Clark were off the map. They had no, no paper to go by. They had the only way they navigated was only by a compass and a sextant. Now, those of you, you know what a compass is, but a sextant can actually place you where you are on the planet. And I don't know if you know how that's done, but it's a device that is called shooting the moon or shooting the sun, or the horizon. A device, you bring it up, you get the angle of the sun at a particular time of day. And the scientists have already figured out the angle where you are on the earth with a big log book. And you can shoot the angle and the time of day, and look in the great big book, and you can find out where longitudinal and latitude where you are. And so they constantly were using the sextant to find out where they were. They had to make a choice. And so they made the right choice. So it is with Christians. How do we know that we're going in the right direction? How do we know that we're, the choice that we're going to make is going to be the right one? In other words, the question I propose is, how do you know what God's will is for you in life? Now, those of us that are mature Christians, some of us are more mature than others, we've been at it a while. <laughs> and we've developed over time ways that we can really begin to understand what God's purpose and will is for my life. I think I told you before that uh, I came home one time from, uh, I was stationed with the Marines and my son Travis was 10 or 12 years old. And I was, you know, hey, Travis, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with your life? And he kind of, I don't know, I don't know, Dad. I said, you don't have to give me an answer now. You're only 12 years old. And he says, Dad, well, what do you do? He knows that my career had been, you know, bouncing around, doing different things. And, and uh, he was born in a naval hospital when I was on submarines back in Virginia. And then we moved. We've moved so many times. He says, Dad, you know, how do you know? I mean, what do you do, Dad? I said, well, today I didn't break anything. I didn't fix anything. You know, Travis, I just talk to people. And his 12-year-old mind went, that's, that's what you do for a living, Dad, is talk to people? I said, yeah, yeah, that's what I do. I talk to people. Dad, that's the kind of job I want. <laughs> All you got to do is talk to people. Ah, uh, but Travis, you got to know what to say. <laughs> How do you know which direction you should go in life? How do you know God's will? Now, to begin with, I want us to understand there are different types of God's will. The first one is called the general will of God and the specific will of God. So I'm a kind of a graphic guy. I like to see pictures. And so here is what I would call that big blue circle is what I'm going to call the general will of God. The general will is like a circle. And the specific will of God, for me, would be that little dot. The Bible reveals what the general will of God is. That is, if you want to know how I should treat my neighbors, if you want to know how I should treat my family members, this is not a mystery. Go to Scripture. It will tell you how to relate to people around you. That's the general will of God. You want to know what God's will for me is concerning my speech? Lying, false testimony, 
You don't have to have special revelation for that. The Bible already tells you how to conduct yourself in your speech and in your promises and your covenants. The difference between the general will and the specific will of God is what I would call, I've called this myself, uh, the difference between the dot theory. And the dot theory is that some people believe that there's God's will for every specific thing in my life. Everything that I do, the college that I want to attend, the car that I buy, the house that I buy, the job that I get, God is going to reveal to me that very specific will that he has for me for that specific part of my life. I call it the dot because um, they want that target. And I've watched Christians strive and work and try to find that little dot, that specific will of God for their lives. What does God want me to do with my vocation? Which woman or man should I marry in life? God's going to tell me that specific person. And I watch people get frustrated over that because that's their understanding that God is going to reveal specific things and specific targets in my life that I should carry out in my life. I want to give a different understanding. It's the circle theory. It believes that there are a variety of actions that please God. There are boundaries. That's why I say it's the general will of God. But within that circle, there are all kinds of variety of choices that God also celebrates when I choose. For example, a home that you should buy or you're going to buy. Is God going to lead you to that specific, specific home? Or do you believe that God has already given you the ability, the wisdom, the financial means, and the resources around you to make a wise choice in home A or home B? You see what I'm saying? And I've watched Christians who have focused in on that dot get paralyzed. They don't move. They say, well, God's got to reveal that to me. God's got to tell me this is the house. And I'm saying, if you're operating within the general will of God, then you can rest assured that God is going to bless your choices. People who are willing to make those kind of choices within the circle are what I call movers. Sometimes the the new believers, the dot Christians, need help. Just like my son, when he was a small child, I would say, Travis, don't run into the street. (laughs) That's God's will for your life. Don't run into the street. (laughs) He needed very specific instructions. (laughs) But when he became an adult, I don't have to worry about Travis running into the street. Why? Because I can trust him to make those wise decisions. So a new believer often needs those specific instructions about how to live the Christian life. But the mature Christian generally has already disciplined themselves because they've learned enough about the character and the nature of of God to know what is right and what is wrong. As I talked about in my Sunday school class this morning, we were studying Hebrews. And I've said this before in other sermons, particularly for young people. The time to decide what I'm going to do in a situation is not when the situation arrives. This is where young people really get into trouble. That the time to decide how to respond and make a choice in a certain situation is not when it arises. It should be before it arises. You know, I spent eight years with the Marines. What do you think the Marines did during peacetime? Train over and over and over and over again. Why? Because there could be a time when that action needed a response. And in a simplistic way, when the captain says, let's charge, it's not the time for the Marine to stand there in the ditch and go, you know what, let me think this over. (laughs) I'm not sure this is the right choice for me. Yeah, I don't know, you know, no. He reacts. He responds. You fight as you train. You train as you fight. And so it is in the Christian life. We need to have discipline and training 
as we make choices in life. And so as a mature Christian, because of those of you who are considered mature Christians, then as you encounter situations in life, you already have a foundation and a system of trying to find your way. You already know how you're going to respond. I may have told you the story of my son, Travis. He played football in high school. He wasn't good. (laughs) They made it to the state, and they were down at the stadium, and um, all he wanted to do was get into the special games, you know, the special team, get out on the field. And he was happy to do that. But at some point along the way, I kept telling Travis, now listen, this is a rough school, you know, down in Oceanside. And sure enough, Travis, there's going to be a time and a place when you're going to be challenged in your Christian faith. And he says, well, Dad, it's already happened. I said, what's that? He said, well, the other day I came home from practice. And it was, practice was over and a bunch of guys said, hey, hey, cook, we'll give you a ride home. So he jumps on the car with the guys and, you know, they got their helmets and everything and, they all, and he's taking it home. Well, next thing you know, someone pulls out a six-pack of beer. Juniors and seniors in high school, a six-pack of beer. Hey, cook, you want a beer? Now, I've told Travis a story of my family, how my mom and dad were, my parents were alcoholics. And I choose not to drink because I know what I'm capable of because I used to drink when I, before I was a Christian. I know what I'm capable of doing when I drink. So I don't drink because I know me. You get my drift? So he knew this story. And so Travis goes, hey, Cook, you want a beer? And he goes, no, I'm allergic to alcohol. <laughs> what? How can you be allergic to alcohol? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, Dad, you said, you know, Grandpa and Grandma. Oh, okay, I get your story. The kids in the car, they just kind of went, oh, okay. So they bypassed him. I said, what'd you do next? He goes, Dad, I told him to stop the car. I got out. Man, I was so proud of that guy, right? He knew already what his boundaries were in the general will of God. He, he already knew what he was going to do when he encountered whatever the situation might be. He was going to do the right thing. I was so proud of him. But he had to walk home. <laughs> so as we walk in the general will of God, you will discover the specific will of God for your life. Just like Lewis and Clark, when they were off the map, They had to use the compass and the sextant to find their way. I believe there are at least three ways to discover God's will for your life. And these are just very quickly. So when you find yourself off the map in life, here's the first thing that you need to do to help you get back onto the map. First of all is the Bible. When you're off the map, turn to the Bible. Now we have already talked about that. The Bible reveals the general will of God for your life. It provides that boundary So if you want to know what God's general will for your life is, study the Bible. (laughs) Right, John? (laughs) Study it. Memorize it. Here at HNC, we have all kinds of small groups that meet together for that opportunity. I teach one. I just happen to teach one. 9.30 in the morning here on Sunday morning in a small group. We study verse by verse by verse. We're in Hebrews right now. So if you feel like you're at the end of the map, you don't know which way to go, study the scripture. Second one is the Holy Spirit. Christians believe that once you become a believer, the Holy Spirit begins to infill your life. And that when you do that, the Holy Spirit comforts you, empowers you, but also guides you through the Holy Spirit in your life. When I was on submarines, The question that people always ask me all the time, other than, you know, um, how did you get air? Or where did you get your food? And all those kind of questions. But one of the interesting questions is, if the submarine is submerged for three months at a time, which it was, never coming up, how in the world did the submarine know where it's at? It's not like you can get out your GPS or send an antenna up on the surface and find where GPS didn't do that. Completely submerged three months. How in the world does a submarine know where it's at? 
You've got your puzzle now, don't you? Simple. The engineers came up with a thing called the internal navigation system. It's just a giant gyroscope, twice as big as this table. They spin it up, they keep it spinning, they zero it at the pier. They know where the pier is. <laughs> they zero that thing. And so no matter which way the submarine goes, up, down, port, starboard, wherever it goes all over the world, that gyroscope knows exactly how far you've gone and which way you've turned by its internal navigation system. I think there's a sermon in there. The Holy Spirit in our lives and our conscience is our internal navigation system. Leads and guides us. That still small voice. Tom, you're doing okay. You're doing all right. Tom, you need, you need to comport a little bit. <laughs> Tom, you need to go deeper a little bit. So there's the Bible, the Holy Spirit. Finally, there is the, the body of Christ. There's no such thing in the Christian life as a lone ranger Christian. There's no such thing. We learn and grow and develop as Christian character based upon the fact that we interact with other believers around us. So I'm being honest with you when I say, I really do need you. And you need the, the brothers and sisters around you as well. I gave the example when I was in Sunday school this morning, we were talking about this very thing. I was stationed with the Marines for eight years. It's called the Marine Corps, C-O-R-P-S, corpse, corps, Latin for the word body, the Marine body. <laughs> They're proud of that fact. Every Marine's a fighting Marine. There are no non-combatants in the Marine Corps. That's why they use Navy chaplains, Navy doctors, Navy dentists. Every Marine is a fighting Marine. The Army can't say that. Sorry for anybody who's in the Army. Because the Army has their own doctors and dentists and chaplains. Their identity of who they are as a Marine comes from the Marine Corps. It's embedded in them. As they go into boot camp, they learn the history and the tradition of the Marine Corps. Wherever they go, there's emblems and slogans, Semper Fidelis. All of these things are embedded in them. They begin to take on the persona of what it really means to be a Marine. Their understanding of what it is to be a member of the United States Marine Corps comes from the core, the body. And so I'm saying to you that as a believer in Christ, I need the body of Christ. I need you. I need you from time to time to either confirm or affirm in my life that I'm moving in the right direction. Sometimes new believers or even mature believers submit themselves to the body of Christ and ask this question, am I moving in the right direction? As a candidate for the ministry, I had to go before a number of boards, and Pastor Ryan has talked about some of those in the past. Some of those boards have actually told young men and women, I'm sorry, we understand that you believe that you're called by God to be a full-time minister. But we're saying to you, we can't confirm that within you. Because of financial mismanagement, you're tremendously in debt. Which is an example of my own ability to discipline myself. Or it might be something else in their life that they see that is not in harmony with what they would believe to be the path of a Full-time minister. How dare other people challenge someone who says he's called by God to be a minister? Well, I suppose God can call someone out of the blue, an individual, and they just go off and become some sort of itinerant minister in and of themselves. But they have no credibility because they haven't been endorsed or vetted or confirmed by the church, by the body of believers. Am I making sense there? I had a friend of mine, my hunting buddy back in Eastern Oregon. He was furious. He went to another church right in town where I was. And sometimes he would come to the Nazarene church. He got to bounce around. He had a daughter who played a, played a saxophone. We had a worship team. They had a big worship team. And she wanted to play the, work, the saxophone 
in the worship team, Sam. She wasn't a very good saxophonist. And it was a big bass sax. And, you know, they said, well, okay, let's have an audition. So they auditioned for her to play on the worship team. She, she didn't do well. She, in fact, she did pretty bad. Kelly was furious. He, as we were driving to the next hunting spot, he was, he was just unloading on me. How, how can that church deny my daughter's calling to be on the, the ministry team by playing a sax? I said, well, Kelly, does she play well? Well, not really. <laughs> I said, well, maybe the church has a right to say, you know, we know you say that you want, you're called to be in the ministry team, but we don't see that. We don't see you have the, the talent or the skill or the gift that God would give for someone to be on the worship team. It rubbed him the long, wrong way that the church would one voice say no. Sometimes the church has to do that. Sometimes the church has to disappoint people because they cannot confirm what that individual is saying in their life. I hope I'm making sense there. We learn, we grow, and we develop our Christian character by interacting with other believers. Paul tells the Romans in his letter in 12, 1 through 2. He says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And here is the key verse. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good and pleasing and perfect will. You want to know God's will? Paul says, first of all, become a living sacrifice. Now, he's not talking about physically laying your body down and sacrificing your body. What he's talking about is, is that your entire being, your totality, Tom Cook, the living person, becomes a living sacrifice to God. All that I have, all that I am, all that I will be is his. It's hard to say, isn't it? I remember the first time I was truly broken by God in this manner. I may have told the story that I was right out of, you know, remember I was in the Navy for six years and went to NNU, NNC, excuse me, NNC back in those days, graduated in three years, went on to seminary, graduated in three years. So now at the age of 20, the age of 30, I'm finally, finally, finally feel called to a church. Now, before I got there, when I was in seminary, the district superintendents for all the districts around, they would come and have a big powwow, and the seminarians would go up and interview with all the different superintendents from whatever region they're from and, and see what churches are open. And you pray about it, and then the superintendents make that choice of selection. They submit it to the church, and it's a process. But in that process, they handed out a piece of paper for the candidates to fill out. And one of the questions was, where do you see yourself in a church? I got a master's degree. Watch this. A church to two to three hundred people. <laughs> well, that's where I saw myself. I deserve to be in a church of two to three hundred people. Never passed a church in my life. Well, I didn't get that church. <laughs> I wound up going to a church in Provo, Utah with 20 people. I flew out there from Kansas City just to interview with the church, and I was going to preach that day, and somewhere they got another five people because there was 25 in the congregation. <laughs> As I stood up to the pulpit, all I could do was weep. I just started bawling. I mean, not crying, weeping. I was called into the ministry just a year after I was saved in the early 70s. 
I couldn't understand why God would keep me in the military. So I spent another five, four or five years in the Navy and submarines and got married and had a kid. And now I drive all the way across the United States and sacrifice to go to NNC. And while I was there for three years, then I finally go to Kansas City and sacrifice to go through school. I graduated, by the way, with no debt because I worked my way through school. I deserve something better, Lord. <laughs> God says, no, Tom, this is it. This is the place right here. 25 people. Tom Cook's spirit, my human spirit, was crushed. And to yield to that, to give to that, to place myself in that, not only hurt, but it also was so freeing. You know what I'm saying? I gave that up. I said, Lord, I, I don't care what my human dreams were anymore. I am now where you want me to be. And so the three years I was in Provo, Utah, the ministry was fantastic. The church grew, and I grew as a, as a believer in the situations that I was in. And then I went into the military from there. So to become a living sacrifice, that is what Paul is talking about. Then he says, don't conform to the world, but be transformed in your mind. As other versions say, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. <laughs> what is disturbing today is that I see Christians are no different than what I see in the world. I'm going to be honest. I look at their character, their behavior, their lifestyle, and I don't see much difference between the world and those that profess to follow Christ. Lord, help us. Don't allow the world to squeeze you into its mold. Do not conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we have the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and the body of Christ that leads us and guides us as we're making our journey in this great adventure of life. The most famous entry in Lewis's journal came after traveling almost 4,000 miles into the expedition. The fog lifted one morning over the Columbia River, and they saw nothing but water as far as the horizon. Lewis writes in his journal, Ocean in view, oh, the joy. We, too, are headed into an unmapped land, we're headed into a territory, and I got to tell you, when you watch the six o'clock news, it's, it could be very unnerving. But as the writer of Hebrews encourages in Hebrews 12 too, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So we too can cry out, oh, the joy. Did you get that word in there? He is our pioneer. <laughs> He's gone before us. If we fix our eyes and our hearts on him. In a few moments, we're going to have communion together. It is a, in a sense, a reenactment of the sacrifice that Christ made for us as we break the bread and partake of the juice, of what he's done for us, that he's gone before us and provided a way for our salvation. So I ask the ushers now if they'll come forward. Our communion is open to anyone who believes. doesn't matter which church you're part of, or a member or non-member, as long as you're a believer in Christ, you're welcome to come at the table together.
as they're distributing the elements, take this time to reflect. Take this time to allow the Lord to speak to you. Are you hearing his voice and guiding you and leading you in his will? Are you fixing your eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith? Scripture says that on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and said, This is my body, which was broken for you. Take in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is a, my blood for a new covenant for you. Whenever you take my cup or my bread, my body, you proclaim his death until he returns. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. The pioneer of our faith, and we find ourselves, Lord, wandering in life, no direction, seemingly lost in life, Lord. You're the one who comes to us speaks to us through Scripture, through the Holy Spirit, and even with the body of Christ itself, Lord, to bring us back to you. And for that, Lord, we will give you, always give you thanks, for your love endures forever. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and sing one more song. <laughs>